Seems like everyone accepts the Zohar. What does accept mean? Agreement as to its origin, or also as basis for religious practice? And acceptance based on what? Based on the fact that everyone else accepts it? So everyone accepts the Zohar on the basis that everyone accepts the Zohar. Does Torah obligate us to accept the Zohar or other secret mystical texts? What is the extent of such texts' authority? The answer to these questions is entirely independent from the question as to the true authorship or antiquity of these texts. I want you to answer the question for yourself in light of the information I shall provide in this video. We are taught in Bava Masliya, Daf Nun Peth, Daf 59, that halachic decisions, decisions regarding how to implement Jewish law, are to be based on logical debate within the context of a Beit Din Gadol, a great Sanhedrin, followed by a majority ruling regarding the debated matter. The authoritative decisions of Jewish law are not based on mystical knowledge, as it is widely known. Once the conclusion of the Beit Din Gadol is publicized, we are then obligated to heed the publicized decree, as the Torah states, According to the matter that they shall tell you, from that place which the Lord shall choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they instruct you. Notice the Torah only obligates us to heed the judges referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 8. And only when they act in unison as one body. Notice use of the word they. All the verbs are plural. The opinions of Hillel only became Jewish law when the majority of the judges ruled in agreement with the propositions of Hillel. This is also the reason that the Talmud Yerushalmi records Shimon bin Yohai as acting contrary to his own opinions regarding Jewish law. When he was confronted about the matter, why he was acting contrary to his own opinions, he explained that this was because the sages ruled differently from how he held. And as such, he was obligated to follow the sages. Also, the Torah only obligates us to heed what they instruct us, what these judges proclaim, not some secret mystical knowledge that they keep to themselves. And Torah only obligates us to heed what they proclaim when proclaimed from the chosen place, only when they proclaim their instruction from a specific, special location. The place the specific place that the Lord will choose. And we know this place to be the Temple Mount, Har Habayith. So we are obligated from the Torah to heed the rulings of this court only, only when decreed by the court, they in plural, and only when they decree their rulings from the Temple Mount. This is the basis for the concept that we are only rabbinically required to heed the rulings of this court that were made after it was exiled from the Temple Mount. And once the court was disbanded altogether, and those with the original authentic semicha, historical rabbinic ordination, either died or were executed, there no longer remained a court which we are obligated from the Torah to heed, neither by Torah law nor by rabbinic law. The authority of all later courts, regardless of size or wisdom, lack authority from the Torah to make rulings that are binding on all Israel. So long as they lack the original authentic smicha, are not 71 judges acting together as one body, and are not functioning as a court on the Temple Mount. They have no authority from the Torah. The authority of such later inferior courts is restricted to only a few matters, such as financial disputes. And this authority was only to carry out judgments in accordance with the rulings already made by the ancient defunct court. They possess no authority to create or innovate new rulings or practices and enforce them on the people of Israel. Clearly, however, new times bring new circumstances. How then are we to know what to do when the authoritative court of 71 is defunct as today? Our only option is to be as familiar with the rulings of the authoritative ancient court as we can, as well as know in what manner they debated and came to the conclusions that are recorded. And based on this knowledge, use reason to determine how their ancient laws either apply or do not apply in new situations. So how is this any different from what the ancient court actually did? The essential difference is only unity and authority. So long as a great Torah scholar of any generation decides alone how ancient law is to be applied outside the context of 71 judges with Semicha, it remains his own unbinding opinion, no matter how logical it seems to him or to other people. And such is the case today. The great Torah scholars of today disagree on numerous matters. But so long as a modern application of ancient legislation has reasonable basis in the rulings of the ancient sages, 
not usurping their ancient teachings, it is permissible to follow the modern ruling. Each community and individual voluntarily decides what great Torah scholar he will rely upon. Ultimately, it is the individual's responsibility what scholar he will heed and what community he will join. The only customs a person must adopt or the specific practices the Talmudic sages taught are dependent upon local custom. And the customs are not allowed to permit what the sages themselves have prohibited, as we find in Shivitat Asar, chapter 3, verse 3, in the Mishneh Torah. No Torah scholar has intrinsic authority over another. The authority lies solely in the degree of logical consistency of any given modern application of ancient Jewish law, just as the Rambam explained in his beginning introduction to the Mishneh Torah. Let us not forget that God commanded regarding a special sacrifice to be made when the, quote, eyes of the community, as in the language of the Torah, the Greek Sanhedrin, cause the masses to sin by publicizing an erroneous ruling. Are modern rabbis more infallible than the Greek Sanhedrin, regarding whom this Torah commandment applies? The laws of erroneous rulings, in Chod says otherwise. So some say, I follow the rabbis. That's an extremely oversimplified statement. What rabbis? You follow the majority of modern rabbis and what matters? Certainly you know that they disagree on countless points. Have you taken a poll to see how the majority of Torah scholars hold on each matter of Jewish law? Or do you really just follow what you see every other religious Jew do? If so, is everyone else basing their action on a poll taken as to the majority opinion among ra modern rabbis? Or are the sheep just following the sheep? The Zohar doesn't fulfill any of the criteria for obligatory Jewish law, unless one wants to blindly think so. But that's no different from a Christian accepting the New Testament just because every other Christian accepts it. Neither the Zohar nor its unique teachings were publicly proclaimed by the ancient court of 71. Neither while this court was on the Temple Mount, nor when this court was exiled from the Temple Mount. It is a violation of Torah to act upon anything espoused by the Zohar that contradicts the teaching of the ancient court of Israel, whose binding teachings are recorded solely in the Talmudic literature. And one who says that a person not acting in accordance with the Zohar himself violates the Torah prohibition against adding to the Torah, for such a person has given authority to the Zohar, which God has solely given to the public rulings of the judges mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 17. The sages of Israel did give rulings as to how valid esoteric teachings are permitted to be taught and learned. But the Zohar is neither learned nor taught with respect to the parameters laid down by the Talmudic sages. And the content of valid esoteric teachings cannot, by definition, be publicized to the masses. Therefore, such valid esoteric teachings, while they do exist, do not fall under the category of kechol asher yegiru lecha, that you should do according to all that they tell you, because Talmudic law forbids the telling of esoteric teachings. They are neither to be publicly proclaimed, nor are they to be expounded upon to the worthy. They are not practical Jewish law. They are not halakha lama'aseh. This is precisely why in Hilchot Yesodeya Torah, chapter 2, in the 12th law, it is explained that the esoteric teachings are to be understood from one's own mind, the end of a concept and its depth. Because, as Talmud Torah, chapter 1, the 13th law, teaches knowledge that is acquired by, quote, the contemplating or the conceptualizing the end of a concept from its beginning and inferring one concept from another, does not fall under the status of the oral law, but rather under the category of the concept of Talmud and the understanding of the Mishneh Torah. Talmud, here not referring to Talmudic literature, but to the practice of, quote, conceptualizing the end of a concept from its beginning, inferring one concept from another. So, to equate the even valid esoteric teachings to the Torah itself, whether oral or written, is a violation of adding to the Torah. And even if one were to desire to disagree, to deny that this is a valid opinion from valid, ancient, respectable, universally recognized Jewish sources is to simply ignore the facts. Once you realize that esoteric teachings are not Jewish law, it then becomes clear how the Rambam regarded the Mishnah Torah as covering all areas of Jewish law, despite that as he wrote to Moreh and Nebuchim, that the original esoteric teachings did not reach his generation. If you are interested in learning more about Torah Judaism, please visit bejewish.org. That's bejewish.org. Shalom uvracham.